Okay, go right ahead. Um, so I guess uh, um, you've already worked with some of my colleagues this year. So I, I mean, I know that Daphne is basically trying to help us um, I think her goal is basically to have us write an op-ed, um, which I think this maybe will eventually be an op-ed that would be a call to action for what I'm proposing. But I, I would actually like, um, I think this is a feasible proposal that I'm making, and I would love to have it have legs and um, be something that could actually happen with the city council. And so my goal is to make this ask of this of the city to use some of the funds that they've already allocated or are planning to allocate um, toward landscaping or that, you know, funds that are being used for kind of not such useful purposes like polygraphing police candidates um, that I saw in the December agenda as a line item um, and put it toward addressing food insecurity in Richmond, which is a growing problem um, by instead of planting ornamental plants, which they've, uh, as far as I can tell, they've allocated quite a bit of money toward doing that, um, planting like fruit trees or other um, food producing, you know, um, plants. That's not a super sexy one-liner for you, but. Well, that's part of what we're gonna work toward, but it is a very juicy and uh, nutri nutrient dense topic. And I'm really <laughs> excited to get into it. It's going to be fantastic. Now, first, I want to just say that, as you, I'm sure, know, one of the most effective ways that we can lobby our democratic elected governments at all levels is through persuasive, cogent, and data-backed public persuasive communication. And when it comes from a physician like yourself, it could be especially important and especially impactful. The key is to have an argument that makes sense, that inspires passion and belief, and also gets a great deal of people to also believe in it. This isn't about being a dry position paper, but it is about being persuasive and it's about a call to action. And when you're doing public communications, you also always wanna think in terms of your audience and your readership. You're not writing this as an internal memo for one elected official. You're writing it for our society at large. And you want those elected officials to pay heed as well. Now, we'll get into some of the nuts and bolts of how to make that happen. Before we do, I want to just do a time check. I want to be as efficient as possible. We have until 3.30. We could, of course, end early, but it oftentimes is difficult to do that. What I'd like to do is take a couple of quick minutes first. To, for you to please introduce yourself, your background. I want to know a little bit about you. I want to tell you a little bit about me, and then I want to dive in anew. So if you could, Dr. Adrienne, tell me a little more. So I am a family medicine uh, resident working here in the community of Richmond, and I work with um, a lot of under um, under-resourced patients, and many of whom are actually even unhoused. Um, and many more who are food insecure. Outstanding. And uh, your background, where are you from? Uh, what, what, and actually, where are you from? And really, what brought you to medicine? So I, um, <laughs> I have lived in nine states. I grew up in Texas, but um, that wasn't my scene. So I left. Um, but I, I did a lot of advocacy work. Um, and felt that I really wanted to make a tangible difference in people's lives. And I thought medicine might be a way to do that. Wow, wonderful. Well, uh, welcome aboard, welcome to the field, welcome to the community. Um, maybe you've been here a while, maybe that's not necessary, but I just have to tell you, I'm always excited um, to hear about people who wanna get into medicine, wellness, public health, public service in any stripe and just be part of the solution, part of a better tomorrow in our communities. So we love working with Lifelong. We love working with the residents there. Um, to be a part of this program and to, to help in some small way was a delight to us. And so we're really happy to be here. Uh, my background, uh, I'm Robert Rogers. Good to meet you again. And uh, I'm from Southern California originally, came to the Bay Area about 15 years ago to go to Berkeley for grad school. Uh, really enjoyed that. I've been a working journalist for about a decade. 
um, both before and after grad school, most recently at the Contra Costa County Times. And then about nine years ago, I made the transition into public service where I now work as a deputy to the county supervisor, John Joya. And we like to regard ourselves in this office as the public health supervisor. So uh, we do all we can to think about how to advance equity and public health and make our lives uh, stronger, healthier, and longer in this community. So um, in, in that respect, we are certainly, um, we're, we're, we're fighting the same good fight uh, just in different ways. And um, we're really we're really happy to be partners. And Lifelong, lastly, um, it, we're big supporters of Lifelong. They have been a tremendous asset uh, included in our community, especially after the unfortunate and tragic loss of Doctors Hospital. Our community clinics, the work that you do have never been more important, especially due to the, the dearth of traditional hospitals in West County today. Thank you. I mean, I think also though we really constantly feel um, the limitations of what we can do within the, the four walls of a clinic setting and how much um, impact that the social determinants and structural determinants of health have on our patients' health. And that's where actually the work that the city is doing that you're doing makes an even bigger impact on patients' lives because we can write a prescription, but can our patients afford to even fill it? Um, I can encourage my patients with diabetes to eat healthy, but if they don't have anywhere to cook healthy food, how will they do that? Well, as you know, and as I know, uh, the, the growing recognition of the holistic nature of public and personal health is a represents a tremendous advance, in my opinion, in Western medicine and Western society. And uh, I'm really heartened to see it occurring. Uh, we know we must know more that uh, health begins long before a patient with a chronic illness or some malady of some kind shows up at a doctor's office. For sure. Now, let's talk about your incredible plan and how we can elucidate that in a profound and persuasive way. Now, there are different ways to skin this. There's different ways for us to address this. My favorite way, the one that I would like to bring to you would be, especially when you've already got an idea formulating in your mind, I would think that the best way to start is to crystallize the idea I know that we talked earlier about how this is not a formal paper. It's not a position paper or a white paper or a memo to elected official. It's public persuasive communication. That, of course, all connotes this conversational idea. That's all true. But in order for that to work, we need a clear and crystallized thesis supported by some very cogent, accurate, and important data points. Now, they can be brief. They can be clear. They should be but we have to have them. We have to have the nuts and bolts in order to build this beautiful structure. So let's talk about this thesis. Let's, let's build around it really quick. Let's see how we can crystallize. We can call it elevator pitch. We could do those sorts of things, but it is important for us to crystallize it, distill it in our minds and then build onto that. So you've talked about how resources are used in landscaping, right? Public resources and how that represents a resource basket and thus an opportunity for better allocation of resources, presumably in a way that provides benefits that are not being provided now. That benefit being, I guess, increasing the amount of healthy natural food, local agriculture available to people. Am, am, I, am I sort of around yeah. your point? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Now let's, yeah. let's think about how we can crystallize this into a one or two sentence thesis. We don't need to wordsmith it right now. We just need to throw it against the wall. So I was saying um, yesterday, like I think it's time for Richmond to put its um, money where the hungry mouths are and allocate its, um, its budget in a way that addresses um, hunger more efficiently and effectively via, you know, creating um, creating food forests on public property, basically. Excellent. Very good. One of the real uh, powerful touchstones that we often use 
in persuasive communication is this wonderful technique of, of course, there's the opposite, which is everybody knows, right? And that gets used quite a bit. And that can be powerful as well. But there's also this really powerful idea of we all think of it this way, but imagine this, right? And then we show how clear and obvious it could be. And that act of turning on that light, of switching that bulb, that gets people excited and they say, I want to be a part of that too. And especially when it comes from someone, that's why the New York Times and their guest columns, they always love to say a word, a sentence or two about what the person's background is. They love people with subject expertise weighing in in their news pages. That's where you come in, right? In this case, we're talking about up in. So how about something like this? Try this on for size. Local governments across, in this era of reducing chemical-based pesticides and other landscaping aids. In the record, this is not, this is gonna be more, this is throwing us the wall. In the recognition of those negative health impacts, municipal governments across the state are groaning under the strain of trying to maintain public landscaping areas, right? This outlay of vital budget resources is being to some degree squandered when it's focused just on tearing out, just on tearing up unwanted bushes, shrubs, and weeds. When it could be having the doubly important impact of planting the seeds of health for our communities tomorrow, right? So in other words, what you want to do is you want to say, look, everybody's doing it this way, but we're all missing something that's right there. We're all missing this tremendous opportunity. We don't want to miss it anymore. There's an opportunity out there and I'm ready to show it to you. And we could do it so much better. So, first of all, let me just ask you, does that thesis, is that about where we want to go, right? This idea of we spend a lot of money doing this, we could spend it better. And we, get, we spend a lot of money chopping down weeds. We could, with the same money, we could chop down the weeds and we could grow the fruits. Yes. And I think, um, I mean, there, there are so many layers of benefits that can come from it because, um, you know, tree, if you plant fruit trees, you can feed people. Trees do more to sequester carbon than, you know, um, annual flowers do. They do more to help the soil address, you know, um, keeping, addressing water, right? Um, we're having all of this rainfall. We're trying to keep runoff from tearing the soil away. Trees are better at that than lawn or um, other kinds of ground cover that they're commonly used in landscaping. Um, and um, if we're using, like you said, um, organic instead of intensive growing practices, then we can actually start to bring something positive to a community that has historically dealt with so much um, like environmental racism. Oh, so I, I don't, I, I, let me stop you there, please. What, what do you think that my takeaway is from that wonderful soliloquy you just had? I don't know. <laughs> oh. Well, I mean, it could be lots of things, right? It could be you're very smart, you're very charming, you've studied this, right? That could all be the case. But from a professional standpoint, what I say is we have no shortage of good supporting reasons to advance our thesis, right? We have no shortage of that. The only question is, is going to be which ones do we use in which order and how do we lay them out? Mm -hmm. We don't need to stretch to make this case. It's the all of the all of the the information, all of the ammunition is right there for us, right? It's a matter of selection and order and presentation. Now, that's also getting far afield from the thesis. So the thesis is there. The thesis is one that's focused on 
we're spending a lot of money and we're not getting a lot of return. We could solve that problem and have this cascade of ancillary benefits. It's really quite amazing, right? The seed is, and there, there's gonna be, your metaphorical opportunities are gonna be right as well. Now, so we know basically what the thesis is, and the thesis has to be stated very clearly early on in the article. We need to know why we're reading this, what's important, right? Now let's talk about the structure. Now the structure can exist in a few different ways. First, let's talk big picture. Those heavy duty New York Times op-eds, the best ones. Well, you could get the really long one, the 1500 word that David Brooks gets or whatever. But the heavy duty good ones, they, they tend to have that magic number of 750 words, right? I like that. I think you can go there but I think we can always be more effective if we can get shorter, right? So my advice to you would be to aim for something. Now, this is, a, this is a weighty topic. You have a lot of supporting evidence. But if you can aim for the 400 to 500 range, that would probably be most punch. But I, I my recommendation is, is definitely don't go over 750, but if you need to go all the way there, go all the way there. But you're probably going to be better off going shorter. Now, what could this structure look like? Now, again, I want to be very clear that um, although I do have some expertise in this field, I don't have the single answer of what the best way is to do this at this time, right? So what I'm telling you is always going to be um, for you to take into, into consideration. You know, sort of like if you had a malady that could be addressed in a variety of different ways, as opposed to if you have, you know, this knee ligament is torn, there's only one way to fix this, right? Um, so we're, we're definitely talking about the former in this respect. Now, what is an idea for how we could structure this? Well, personally, I like a lot um, the anecdotal lead, and I like it to have some vivid, uh, something vivid in it, because that's gonna be memorable, and that's gonna be a hook, right? So one idea for how we could do this would be something like this, right? Imagine. As a physician in Richmond, I help people all day long with their healthcare needs. Sadly, so much of what I do and so much of what I address has occurred long before the patient has walked through the door. An epiphany hit me recently when I saw a team of work crews out on a median in front of our clinic offices, cutting down the weeds like they do every week or every month. It dawned on me, what if we were using all of these public resources, not just to clear areas of shrubs and weeds, but to convert those areas to fertile, health-promoting local agricultural providers for our community. In doing so, we could solve a whole range of problems far more efficiently than we do today, All right? That's anecdotal lead, that's light bulb moment, and that's thesis, all there. Now we would go into the body and the body would be, let me explain how this would work, right? And now is where you've got to bring in some data points that you research. Now, the, the danger with a topic like this, typically, is an overload of data points. It could I have a really be specific anecdote that I can offer to from a patient and then also branch out. But I have a patient who moved here um, 
and is unhoused and has been living in their car. And when they first came to me, they did not have like their health, their health has steadily declined um, in the two years that I've been treating them. And they now have conditions, including diabetes that they did not have when they moved here. And it's a direct result of the fact that they are living in their car and they don't have access to healthy food and all of the resources that even someplace like our clinic that typically can offer extra resources for people with food insecurity, they can't avail themselves because they have no place to cook food. They have, you know, we have our veggie giveaway that we do every week and the community takes advantage of that even if they're not patient. But this patient can't take advantage of that because they have nowhere to prepare this food. There's your anecdote, and it's excellent. I will caution the challenge with the effective anecdote in the op-ed is you need to tell the story, not in two or three paragraphs, but in two or three sentences, right? Right. And then because it, 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 it takes, it's very quick for people to lose it. They need to know where this is going. You need to connect the anecdote to the thesis, to the solutions, right? So there's your anecdote, the challenge to make it brief. We know the thesis. Your challenge is to wordsmith that, make it extremely distilled and powerful. Then you've got to go into the supporting reasons, right? And this, this, is, both, this is both rhetorical and data-driven, right? Now, the challenge here, we, how many data, data sets, how many numbers can we safely use in making our points here without overloading it, right? Well, typically we would think about in a, in a typical op-ed, I'm gonna say probably no more than five, right? Mm -hmm. Likely two to four would probably be the sweet spot. So anecdote, thesis, connected. Now, what I would start with is something like this, right? Reason one, according to a recent report from the state auditor general, right? I'm just throwing this out, wherever, right? You gotta, you find your data. According to this data, or, or oftentimes we backload that attribution after you make the point and then comma, according to this data, right? Citing the source is the boring part. So it would be something like, cities across California spent $10 billion last year clearing weeds and uh, main, simply maintaining vegetation on public spaces, according to. What did that money truly get California cities? Well, it got them aesthetically more pleasing uh, environments. It also reduced the use of pesticides and so forth. Good things, no doubt. But those dollars could have been spent so much better if we had also done this. Right. According to this, when we plant fruit trees in public spaces, that can reduce maintenance costs moving forward. Right. Now, this could play a role. We know that in the future, locally sourced agriculture is going to be crucial to the health of communities, physically, biologically, environmentally, and fiscally. Right. According to this study, for every acre of this provided in a community, we can expect a 10% reduction in diabetes. Something like that. Then, right, then you, you point out when we do these things, we are also improving the quality of runoff into the bay. We're improving biodiversity in our communities. We are um, we are reducing emissions required, you know, the more that we can move agriculture from the Central Valley to locally sourced, we can, for every ton that we can produce, we can do this, right? Now, don't get bogged down too much in the data. Some of those points can be made simply rhetorically without citing a, a, a data source, but some you'll want to, you'll want to do that, right? Especially when you have a G whiz uh, data set or a G whiz data point that's going to the question is always, is it interesting, right? That really blows my mind. If you have a, a data point that really blows someone's mind, that's the one to use always.
right? Then what happens as we get toward the end, we revisit, revisit the anecdote and make the point again, right? Make the thesis again in a slightly different way, a concluding way. But it sort of follows the, the structure of your typical great speech, right? Which is tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them how you're gonna tell it over and over again, and then tell, remind them again as you leave the stage, right? It's one of those. So um, I will also have a couple of bullet points to point out, um, you know, look back on your article and do I have a color or two? Do I have a character? Is someone, you know, give me something, right? Whether, you know, I saw the median covered in uh, the two foot tall uh, flashing yellow poppies that are the telltale sign of, of wild weeds in California, right? Something like that. Give me a detail. Give me something vivid. Your old high school teacher who told you, show, don't tell. Give me something of that always. Remember, we have to always remember that in this, we are telling a story. Even if there's just a little element of it, it has to be a story for it to resonate with people. Otherwise, it would just be a table of charts. And we know what we do with, with that in our brains, especially when it comes to public communication. So, uh, with that, we are down to one minute. I also will let you know if you want to send me a draft and um, you know allow me to provide some feedback, I can do that in writing. We can meet again, talk about it again. I've done that with your colleagues. I am available to you. I am really grateful to be with you and be able to share a few ideas. And your ideas sound super exciting, by the way. So I'm very much, if you, if you were to send me a draft, I would read it with relish. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate the meeting. And um, yeah, like it's, um, I'm always trying to come up with, you know, creative problems, like creative solutions to, to problems that we're constantly facing because, um, you know, if they were easy to solve, they, people, somebody would have solved it already. So, um, <laughs> and, uh, but half of the battle is, is, you know, selling your solution. So. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, and by the way, um, I should note another key thing to do in your research if you find a jurisdiction that's done something like this successfully, definitely have that in your article. If no one has, definitely have that in your article too, right? In other words, you could turn them both into a strength. Either here's a dem demonstration of how awesome this is, or this is so awesome. This is so novel. We can strike gold. We, we can change the world together here. Yeah, there's nothing Americans love more than the idea of being like the cowboy, the first to do it. Yep. The rugged individualist, right? Well, that, that can help. But like I said, <laughs> if, someone, if someone else has done it before and done it yeah. well, oh, we, we, we want that. Yeah. That's exhibit A. Well, Adrian, thank, thank you, you so much. much. And you want me to, you, um, if, you, uh, if you feel, as, uh, if you email me, um, I'm always going to be receptive and it's really been a delightful meeting. It's been wonderful meeting with you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Robert. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.